Hello class, this week we're going to go over chapter 9 from the textbook and we'll be talking about social stratification in the United States. Another term for social stratification um, is social inequality. So stratification just refers to um, the way that societies split up the populations within society into different groupings and usually in some sort of hierarchical order. So one pretty glaring example that we're all probably well aware of is um, like the stratification system in Egyptian society where you can see the uh, graphic on this slide with the pharaoh on top and government officials below that, then soldiers, scribes, then merchants, craftsmen, and then with peasants and slaves at the bottom. So that was the Egyptian stratification system, but we're gonna um, particularly focus on the US this week. And for chapter 10, we'll come back and look at um, social stratification from a global perspective. So as usual, on the first few slides, we will cover um, some definitions just to serve as a basis uh, for the rest of the lecture. So social stratification is defined as a society's categorization of its people into rankings of socioeconomic tiers, and that can be based on factors like wealth, income, race, education, and power. Um, stratification is not only about individual inequalities, but it's about systemic inequalities based on group membership, uh, associated status, and different classes. So although individuals may support or fight inequalities, Social stratification is created and supported by society as a whole. So if you think back to um, the sociological imagination reading where we talked about troubles and issues and troubles were more personal problems. Um, remember we said if you know unemployment is very, very low in the country and someone is unemployed, uh, that probably says more about the individual and that would be an example of a personal trouble. But if um, unemployment is at 20% in a country and someone is unemployed, it says more um, something more systemic about what's happening in society um, and the divisions and disadvantages that are occurring and happening to entire groups of people, not just a few people here or there, outliers, but um, an entire group of people within society is affected um, in terms of their status. So social stratification, let's go a little bit deeper into what that means here. So some factors that define stratification. Like most of what we talk about in this class, um, the way that uh, stratification is interpreted depends on what society you're looking at. Um, so how we define it, it can vary across different societies. In most of today's societies, modern society, stratification is based on your economic status. So it's based on your wealth, which is the net value of money and assets a person has, and your income which are the wages or salary that a person earns. So your income is what you bring in on a yearly basis. So what your paychecks um, bring into your bank account each year. But wealth is kind of the um, overarching everything that you own and what it's worth. How much is your home worth, your car, if you have any other assets or um, stocks and bonds, all of that combined is wealth and income just refers to what you're getting paid um, by your job each year. 
So some other important factors that influence social rank kind of beyond just your wealth and income could be wisdom and charisma, um, education and occupation. So um, teachers have a pretty high um, rank in terms of status in the country, but they don't get paid um, very well compared to other professions that are highly respected. Um, then we have doctors, obviously, have high status, high rank in society. Um, same with CEOs. And then your janitors or your waitresses have a lower kind of common status in society in terms of the way our society defines uh, status. Um, another important factor that can influence your social rank would be your parents or your lineage. So who your parents are is um, and what they do and the wealth that they have accumulated, um, even the, your grandparents' wealth that they accumulated, all of these things can be a crucial determinant of your own social position. Our parents and our families, they pass on cultural norms that accompany a lifestyle of a certain social rank. Um, another factor would be age. So in some societies, the elderly are revered, um, like in China and Japan and uh, countries who have a history of Confucian beliefs, which we'll talk about uh, later, I think in chapter 13. But then in other countries, the um, older or the elderly and older individuals are ridiculed or disregarded. Um, so yes, we'll talk about ageism uh, in a few chapters and draw out that a bit more later in this class. Now on this slide, social mobility, we'll go over um, several more kind of introductory definitions to get us ready for the rest of the lecture material. So social mobility is defined as the ability to change position within a social stratification system. So when people improve or diminish their status in a way that changes their social ranking, they experience social mobility. So there's five different types of social mobility here. First, we have upward mobility, and that is when a person shifts upward in social class. So they rise from poverty to wealth. Maybe they work really hard, get a college degree, um, do an apprenticeship or training, eventually land a great job with job security, um, and they're able to start saving and uh, better themselves, and that would be upward mobility. Then on the other end of the spectrum, we have downward mobility, and that's when somebody lowers their social class. And there are a lot of things that can cause downward mobility, but some are um, unemployment, maybe unexpected unemployment, bankruptcy, an illness that keeps you from being able to work and also kind of builds up your medical bills and what you owe, um, the amount of debt you're in, uh, dropping out of school, and especially for women, getting a divorce can cause a lot of downward mobility. Because generally, um, though there are definitely exceptions, generally the man uh, in a relationship makes more money than the woman. So when a divorce happens, the woman, um, if she even does work, is bringing in a lot less than she's used to. In addition, women usually um, end up uh, with custody or greater custody of um, children. Then the third type of social mobility is intergenerational mobility. So intergenerational refers to when different generations of a family belong to varying social classes. So that's different generations. So that would be um, 
if your grandparents were very, very um, poor and then your parents kind of worked their way up to middle class and um, provided for you and made sure that you did well in school and then you um, yourself are maybe upper middle class. So that's intergenerational mobility. It's different generations of the family um, belonging to different social groups. Then we have intragenerational mobility. So that's within the same generation. So intragenerational mobility is when family members of the same generation belong to different social classes. So let's say um, I have two sisters. Let's say I'm middle class. Uh, my sister maybe didn't make great decisions in her life and she's become more lower class, you know, maybe makes uh, 27000 a year. And then my other sister has worked very hard, went to law school, um, and is now making, you know, 100000 a year. So that would be intra-generational mobility. It's the same. Um, nuclear family, the same generation of children, but they belong to different social classes. And the last one is structural mobility. So structural mobility kind of goes beyond the individual or the individual family and looks at when societal changes enable an entire group of people to move up or down in social standing. So some examples, um, industrialization it led to upward structural mobility when it first started. There were a lot more jobs available, um, more money was being made and a higher standard of living um, came about. Now on the opposite side, we have downward structural mobility which would be, um, an example would be when U.S. jobs are outsourced to, say, Mexico or China or Pakistan. So the factories disappear, um, entire groups of people in the country are suddenly jobless unexpectedly, and that leads an entire group of people kind of downward in terms of their um, social standing. and they um, experience less job opportunities and lower standards of living. On this slide, we'll talk a little bit about class traits. They're also known as class markers. And basically class traits are just the way you expect um, people of a certain class to talk, to behave, um, and what you imagine people of a certain class may be doing in their free time. So class traits are the typical behaviors, customs, and norms that define a class. They indicate the level of exposure a person has to a wide range of cultures, and class traits can indicate the amount of resources and time a person has to spend on hobbies, leisure activities, and vacations. So for example, the rich are associated with expensive clothing, luxury cars, opulent vacations, golf, opera, um, high-end charity events and galas, while the middle class and the lower class is associated um, more with like camping or fishing, bowling, shopping at the mall or uh, TJ Maxx and other retailers and more participation in community events like um, fairs or parades, things that are cheaper, more cheap activities. Um, whereas the richest class traits is more associated with, um, you know, like a private yacht or a vacation home or several vacation homes. Um, and then the middle and lower class might be more associated with um, Airbnb stays or uh, timeshare. 
And then there's also way, um, different ways of talking. So um, you can imagine certain uh, verbiage and um, words that are chosen if you're in, in an upper class um, socialite party where everyone's gone to expensive private boarding schools their whole life. Um, they probably use kind of more complex words even in their um, casual social conversations. Whereas you won't hear as many, you know, large dictionary words when you're listening to say a middle class or a lower class um, conversation at a party. So there are two categories of stratification systems, either closed or open. So a closed stratification system means that there's very little change in social position allowed. Um, a closed system would not allow individuals to change their ranking, and it does not permit relationships between different um, kind of economic, socioeconomic levels. Then we have open systems, which do allow movement and interaction between social ranks. And open systems are usually um, more geared toward focusing on uh, individual achievement. And so if somebody works really hard, if they're achieving a lot, if they're kind of making their name uh, known, out there, then they will be allowed to um, move up in social rank, regardless of who their parents were or um, their current position. So we're going to look at three different types of stratification systems on the next few slides. And on this slide, we'll start with the caste system. The caste system is a closed system. That means people that are born into their social rank or standing will remain in that social rank or standing their entire life. There won't be any opportunities for that person to improve their social standing. Um, and this is based um, on the Hindu caste system in particular. And you can see the graphic on the right here that um, kind of lays out the different tiers, the hierarchical tiers of um, Hindu stratification and the caste system. So don't know how much you all know about Hinduism, but I'll give you a pretty basic um, summary. So Hinduism um, relies a lot on ideas of karma and reincarnation. And karma pretty much means if you were a good person in this life, then when you die and you're reincarnated, um, your social standing might improve in the next life. But when you're actually in each individual lifetime, you don't try to um, kind of change your, your destiny, your karmic destiny. So kind of trying to get to another level of social rank within your lifetime is kind of sacrilegious to Hindu belief systems. You are to kind of wait until that next lifetime when you're reincarnated to see if your good acts have paid off and you can move up in social rank during your next lifetime. Um, so in Hindu society, you are to accept your social standing as a moral duty. Because if you're born um, a poor person, then to a Hindu, someone who has this belief system, they would believe, um, well, I must have done something in my past life that brought me to this um, low social position now. So in Hindu caste systems, people are expected to work and marry according to their caste ranking. So a poor person cannot um, go and marry a richer person. And this is called an endogamous union. So endo meaning within. So you're, you can only marry within your caste or your social position. And the Hindu caste system 
um, because of that karmic kind of belief system and belief in uh, reincarnation it promotes beliefs in fate destiny the will of a higher power rather than promoting the ideal of individual freedom and you can see on the picture over there the Hindu caste system with the Brahmin the priests and the teachers at the highest social position followed by the warriors and the rulers who are then followed by farmers, traders, and merchants, followed by laborers, and then with the um, Dali or the outcast um, social strata, the street sweepers and latrine cleaners um, at the bottom. Next, we will look at the class system, which uh, we in the US are fairly um, knowledgeable about. So the class system is an open system. So that means you, we can theoretically move between classes. We can go up in class and position and we can go down. Um, so class is defined as a set of people who share similar status according to their wealth, income, education, and occupation. And it's based on social factors as well as individual achievement and personal choice. And we'll talk about a lot of those social factors in the uh, slides to come here. Again, with an open system, occupation is not fixed at birth and your social status is not fixed at birth. We are able, um, theoretically again to move up or down the social ladder based on our um, personal achievements although there are some social constraints that will keep people from moving up or down which we will get to and within open systems exogamous unions are allowed so that means that people are allowed to socialize with and marry people from different social classes so exo meaning outside so you can move or marry outside your own social class the third type of stratification system is referred to as a meritocracy so let's read through this little comic strip over here, a little graphic on this slide, and then we'll talk a little bit more about meritocracy. So you can see um, the comic here. He says, hello, Department of Zoology. I'd like to become a leopard. What can I do? How can I do that? I'll work hard, whatever it takes. I, right now, well, I'm a, currently a common ground squirrel, but, oh, I see. And then he hangs up the phone and thinks to himself the myth of meritocracy so it's a squirrel trying to become a leopard um, says he'll work really hard he'll do anything to do it but obviously there's um, there's a complication with him <laughs> uh, no matter how hard he works he's probably never going to be a leopard so what is a meritocracy it's an ideal system. In other words, it's ideal because there has never truly been a society in which social rank was based purely and only on merit, on how hard somebody worked. So um, the meritocracy is based on the belief that social stratification is the result of personal effort, merit, that determines your social standing. In other words, hard work leads to high social standing. But um, as we see in our own society, although we do kind of promote a meritocratic um, kind of belief system in the US, I'm sure we all know people in our lives who work harder than anyone else we know, and yet they struggle um, to pay their bills or get by or um, achieve job security. And so there's a bit more to uh, society than pure merit. So even the hardest worker might not 
um, have a lot of status or make a lot of money. So things like inheritance and structural inequalities, such as unequal access to a good education, um, they persist and disrupt this notion of a pure meritocracy. So meritocracy, when we call it an ideal system, that means that um, it's something that a lot of societies try to live up to, yet there are all these other social, structural um, impediments that kind of can stand in the way of a purely meritocratic system. Now in all stratification systems, each tier of the stratification system is kind of defined by its standard of living. So standard of living is based on factors like income, employment, class, poverty rates, and housing affordability. The level of wealth available to a certain socioeconomic class in order to acquire and maintain the material necessities and comforts to maintain its lifestyle. So standard of living can also um, sometimes be referred to as quality of life. And it represents factors like the ability to afford a house, um, afford a car, take vacations, afford food for your family, and uh, medical care. Now to many other countries in the world, um, over the history of the United States have looked to us, to the U.S., um, as kind of a, a beacon for a comfortable middle class standard of living. If you think back to like 1950s America, um, where uh, the middle class was incredibly strong, came out of the Second World War, um, a lot of social solidarity, um, the economy was on the up and up, jobs were plentiful, factory work, stable work, and families in the 1950s, um, you can think of all the, all the TV shows during that time, it was really about kind of this very comfortable middle class life of comfortable house, with plenty of room for everyone to sleep and live and have some sense of privacy and security, um, enough money to put food on the table for the family. Um, of course, during the 1950s, a loving wife at home to take care of the kids and um, make dinner and clean the house. And um, of course, over time, kind of that middle class standard of living also includes um, stable employment, a um, ability to pay for your medical bills without going into debt, um, being able to take a vacation once a year, maybe go out to eat um, once a week. So these are all things that kind of the middle class sensibility and lifestyle affords. Now, during the last century, the U.S. has seen a dramatic rise in standard of living, though only a small portion has the means to the highest standard of living. So compared to a century ago, um, probably most of us have uh, a microwave, an oven, a washer and dryer in our home, um, a refrigerator, uh, a dishwasher. All these kind of appliances that are almost part of our daily lives and that we just expect to be in our homes um, a century ago were not common if they were even invented yet. So our standard of living has definitely improved um, over the last century in the United States. However, um, while that standard of living has risen for um, a great deal of our population, um, wealth distribution in our country has um, also kind of 
grown in a way that only the top 1% of the U.S. population now holds the same amount of wealth as the bottom 33%. So even though we all are um, rising in terms of our standard of living, um, there are very, very few in our society who have um, kind of come out with the most wealth as a result of all of our economic progress and growth. Um, so the size, income, and wealth of the middle class has been declining actually since the 1970s. And again, this occurred at the same time that corporate profits were increasing by almost 150% and CEO pay has risen by almost 300%. Um, on the right here, there's a graphic. Um, it's a pretty stark um, photograph from the United States during the Depression era. And you can see these are people lined up at a food bank during the depression because they didn't they were out of work they didn't have money to buy food so um, people were standing in line to get um, their rations to provide for their family and you can see that line of people um, lined up right in front of a um, a painting on the wall that says the world's highest standard of living there's no way like the American way um, then under that I have just a recommendation if you do have Netflix uh, I recommend watching the documentary on there it's called inequality for all and it was produced and it's narrated by um, Robert Reich who worked as an economic advisor in the um, sorry the Clinton and the Jimmy Carter administrations and um, his question in uh, the documentary is where is the middle class going it's shrinking and he tries to answer um, why that's happening and it's a little bit of a broad overview of um, a lot of the things that we'll be talking about during the rest of this lecture. And if you don't have access to Netflix, I did post the um, trailer for the documentary up on the blackboard under your chapter nine video content link. On this slide, there is a link to a, I think it's a 27-minute interview um, conducted by PBS, and they're talking to um, one of the columnists for The Guardian. She's also the author of a book that came out in 2018. It's called Squeezed, Why Our Families Can't Afford America, and her name is Alyssa Court. And um, during this 27 minute interview, she talks about kind of what she's found traveling the country to rural regions across the country um, and talking to middle class people and how they um, get by in America. So she chronicles kind of this plight of American workers today. She talks with lawyers, small business owners, farmers, miners, nail artists, barbers about their personal experiences. Um, in this interview, I'll just um, go over kind of the, the main bullet points of what she goes over. Um, she talks about the fact that three fourths of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, middle class lifestyle is more expensive than it was 30 years ago. So while costs of groceries and rent and insurance has all gone up, mortgages, um, the wages that middle class people have been making have uh, stayed pretty stagnant. They have not kept up with all those increased costs. Um, in addition, since the 1970s, a lot of labor unions have been broken up. Um, there's only a few big unions left in the U.S., but by and large, um, they have been broken up or weakened in terms of their kind of negotiating power. 
Alyssa Court, she talks about um, interviewing some teachers who have to moonlight as Uber drivers. Um, she talks to ranchers whose land has been taken away due to federal land grabs. She talks to college graduates who have to go sell their plasma for extra money on the side. Um, and they discuss the rise of kind of this gig economy. Um, gig economy being all these people who are working for like Instacart, TaskRabbit, Uber, Postmates, um, all these kind of like third party applications that let people work for them and make some money, but it's not really a stable job. There's no benefits, not really any uh, raises to speak of. And most people who work in the gig economy usually have to juggle multiple jobs to make ends meet and to pay their bills. Um, so she proposes um, a few kind of ways to alleviate kind of the shrinking middle class. Um, she talks about um, universal pre-K for children, better and more affordable daycare, um, higher minimum wage laws, and she particularly talks about the fight for $15 an hour, um, and also really emphasizes the need to strengthen rural voices across America to tell their stories and struggles. Um, so it's a good interview. It's it's 27 minutes. Um, it's a bit long, but I hope you all will at least watch the first. You'll get the gist of it in the first 10 minutes or so. Now, when we talk about poverty, it's important to keep in mind kind of these two different definitions of poverty, relative poverty and absolute poverty. So relative poverty is not having the means to live the lifestyle of the average person in your society. So it's kind of comparative poverty, um, whereas absolute poverty is deprivation so severe that it puts one's survival in jeopardy. Um, so the poverty experienced in the US, it's most often relative poverty rather than absolute poverty. Um, you might not have a dishwasher in your house and um, maybe you don't have a washer and dryer, so you have to walk to the closest laundromat to wash your clothes. That would be an example of relative poverty. Maybe you can't afford kind of these um, kind of standard middle class uh, technologies, um, appliances. And so comparatively, when you look, you know, on TV and see that the families on the TV show you're watching have a fridge and a washer dryer and a dishwasher, and then you look around your house and say, oh, well, I don't have a dishwasher or washer dryer. I must be poor. Um, it's kind of more comparative, more relative to kind of the average person in society. Whereas absolute poverty, the kind that we see, um, you know, in Africa or Darfur or um, Bangladesh is when deprivation is so severe, it's putting your very survival in jeopardy um, due to malnutrition or a lack of clean water, a lack of um, plumbing, disease, etc. So we'll talk a lot more about absolute poverty um, next week when we talk about global stratification. Um, but just remember the U.S. Um, when we talk about poverty in the U.S., it's more often relating to relative poverty and not absolute. So as we touched on earlier in the lecture, the United States is an open class system. That's our stratification system. Um, so generally, we think of the American class system as three different tiers, lower class, middle class, and upper class. So we'll kind of just um, go through each of these and what they generally mean um, when we talk about them. So the lower class, it's usually um, the bottom 20% of people in society. 
Um, so you, we can break down the lower class though, because um, people get into the lower class or are situated in the lower class for different reasons. So first we have the working class. These are people who have decent jobs that are hands-on and physically demanding, like cooking, cleaning, or building. Um, maybe someone who works as a dishwasher in a restaurant. It's a stable job. They go in every day. They might work eight to 10 hours, but they might be getting paid minimum wage, seven, 50 an hour or so and so even though they have a stable decent job dishwashing at a nice restaurant um, still their paycheck at the end of the week might be 350 400 dollars after taxes and um, that will still despite having a job put them into the lower class then the next tier um, in the lower class are your working poor. These are more unskilled, low paying employment. Um, jobs are often temporary or part time and they rarely offer any benefits. Um, so this is more of like your contract um, work, maybe construction jobs things that are more temporary, um, not so stable, kind of have to find work every so often, every few months, maybe have to find another person to work for, to offer um, you know, what skills you do have. And again, generally very low pay, um, probably closer to minimum wage. And number three under lower class is the underclass. And these are the unemployed or the underemployed, um, the homeless population. Jobs done by the underclass are usually um, pretty menial tasks for little pay. Then, so our next tier is the middle class. So the middle class is a pretty broad um, group of people. It qualifies as any person kind of within the six, middle 60% of society. And you can see kind of how broad this group is because um, if you look at the way that it's classified, it's anyone whose household income falls between $25,000 and $100,000. So obviously a middle class person bringing in $25,000 is going to have a very different standard of living than someone who's bringing in $100,000 a year. Um, yet both of these families, one making $25,000, the other making $100,000, they're both qualified as middle class. So that's important to keep in mind when we're talking about the middle class in U.S. society. Um, is also how we determine what middle class means. So does middle class mean you make 50,000 a year? Does it mean you make 25? Does it mean you make 100? Um, so the key for the middle class um, is comfort. The ability to just live a comfortable life, not have too many hardships arise, being able to afford the necessities, the basics of life, and not having to worry about that on a daily basis, the way that the lower class does. Um, kind of the dream of the middle class is to kind of get beyond living paycheck to paycheck, to be able to put some savings away, to buy cars, to buy a home, um, to go on a vacation every once in a while with your family, um, kind of just to, to maintain this very mainstream lifestyle and standard of living, that middle class, comfortable standard of living. And then on the top, that top 20% of society, we qualify as the upper class. So this is your class that has the most access to money and power. Um, usually your upper class uh, consists of most of your decision makers in society. 
um, your politicians and CEOs and um, military leaders. So your decision makers that set the agenda and the identity of the country kind of reside in this upper class. Um, and then there is a little bit of a division within the upper class between old money and new money. Um, and if you, I don't know if this is too dated of a reference now, but if you ever seen the movie Titanic, you can kind of see this division between old money and new money in that movie um, where, you know, Rose's family is um, kind of talking trash about um, the indomitable Molly Brown in that movie and how she's new money um, and so they don't respect her as much. So there's kind of this division in the upper class between inherited wealth and the self-made man. So whether you come from old money, a family with a long lineage of wealth and status and influence in society, or if you're new money or the self-made man, um, you're kind of looked at more with uh, a jaundice eye, um, almost as if you don't belong in our, our upper class um, society. This slide has a couple graphics I just want you all to take a look at really quickly. Um, we'll start with this line graph on the left, which is tracing U.S. real average after-tax income um, from 1979 to 2007. Um, so you can see pretty much 99% of society are on these bottom um, three lines here. Let me draw it. So that's 99% of US society from 1979 to 2007. And you can see um, there have been small increases for um, kind of the upper classes and um, not much of a change for uh, the lowest class here on the bottom. They rose very little bit. Um, but then if we look at this blue line here that keeps going up and up, these are your top 1% of the country. So um, they saw a little bit of a dip in, what say around 88 and another dip, um, 92, and then they continued to grow, grow, grow throughout the 90s, um, experienced a bit of a dip there in the early 2000s, and you can see from about 2003 onward, it was a steady climb up in terms of their income. So that's um, the top 1% in the country, and you can see how much their income grew, especially between um, kind of 2002, 2003, and 2007. And again, these bottom three lines here um, represent the rest of our country and how much we have experienced um, growth in terms of our incomes. So obviously the incomes of the top 1% in our society have grown um, quite out of proportion with the rest of society's uh, wage growth. And now let's take a little look at this, um, gra this other graphic here on the right, um, which basically I think it breaks down kind of the inequalities in our society in a very simple way. Um, pretty much by telling you how often, how long somebody has to work to buy a gallon of milk. So we'll start with the minimum wage earner here. And he makes $7.25 an hour. A gallon of milk is $3.70. So it takes him half an hour to pay for one gallon of milk. 
Then we have our medium wage earner here in the middle. He makes $16.57 an hour, not too bad. Again, a gallon of milk is $3.70. It's gonna take our median wage earner 13 minutes to afford a gallon of milk. So about a little less than half the time that the minimum wage earner has to work to afford it. And then we go over here to our CEO guy making a little over $20,000 an hour. Again, a gallon of milk is $3.70, and it takes a CEO guy 0.1 second to afford a gallon of milk. So whereas the CEO takes 0.1 second to afford a gallon of milk, it takes the minimum wage earner half an hour of work to afford that gallon of milk. So that just kind of puts um, puts kind of wealth inequality and income inequality into a pretty simple, um, easy to understand uh, depiction of kind of what it means for us as people who are trying to live and survive and buy groceries. Now on this slide, I have another video. Um, you can find it in the PowerPoint link. It's also linked to, again, in your Chapter 9 video content on Blackboard. Um, so this video compares a survey of American perceptions of wealth inequality in the U.S. with the actual distribution of wealth in the U.S. Um, so the video finds that Americans have a very optimistic idea of how bad wealth inequality really is. And it states that the reality is much more drastic than Americans answer when they're surveyed about what they think about um, wealth inequality. The video illustrates wealth inequality in the U.S. using some pretty stark visual representations. Um, and for instance, the richest 1% of people in the U.S. take home 24% of the nation's wealth today. In 1976, the richest 1% took home only 9% of the nation's wealth. So it's more than um, doubled since 1976, the amount of wealth the 1% is taking home. Um, in addition, another fact this video lays out is that the top 1% in, in American society owns 50% of the country's stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Because as we'll, as I'll kind of reiterate um, in the coming slides, so many Americans live paycheck to paycheck right now. Um, and so many Americans cannot save. And if you don't have money to save and you're living paycheck to paycheck, obviously you don't have money in the stock market or bonds or mutual funds. Um, and so your uh, money isn't really, you don't really have that opportunity to kind of invest and build on your wealth because most of us live um, really paycheck to paycheck. And on this slide, I have one more video. Again, you can find this on Blackboard under the Chapter 9 video content link. Um, but this one is it's probably my favorite of this lecture. Um, it's a 2020 special that Diane Sawyer did. Um, and she called it My Hidden Reality, or My Reality, A Hidden America. And the question that she's asking in this special is, how do Americans achieve the American dream today? That white picket fence, home ownership, job security, the ability to um, provide for your family and build wealth and save, send your um, children to college, all of that. So how is America kind of achieving this American dream today? And is it still even attainable for um, a lot of people? So again, I'll give you some of the 
the highlights from this video. Um, it's a pretty short one. It's 16 minutes, but um, it's, uh, it's pretty moving and um, really covers a lot in those 16 minutes. So here are some of my uh, main points from this video that I took away that I hope you take away as well. So um, she says the U.S. economy has been growing for 30 years, but most Americans have not felt the benefits of that growth. Again, remember a couple slides back, we looked at that line graph of the top 1% income increases since 1979 um, compared to the rest of society. Um, today, 50% of Americans qualify as middle class. Again, we were talking about what qualifies as middle class. Um, she talks about how a family of five today living on $54,000 a year qualifies as middle class according to U.S. classifications. Um, for the first time in half a century, 55% of young middle class Americans are not making as much as their parents made. Um, and so a big part of kind of U.S. society and our history has been kind of creating a world that will be better for our children. And for most, a lot of our history, it has been that way. Each, um, we have kind of this intergenerational mobility since the founding of um, the country. And at least for white Americans who um, were not kind of held back due to larger structural racist policies, um, white Americans have kind of been able to better themselves and each generation um, of American families has kind of risen and risen in the social ranks. But again, she's making this point here that for the first time in a long time, the majority of um, young Americans today are not making as much as their parents made. So there's a bit of downward mobility going on right now. Um, she also um, goes into different middle class neighborhoods, or so um, they're classified at least, but she said she finds that they're actually no longer affordable for, quote, middle class American families. So, for instance, middle class homes in the 1970s that were worth $60,000 today are worth $800,000, and there are not too many middle class families making $50,000 a year who can afford an $800,000 home. Um, so as a result, um, home ownership in America today is at a 50 year low. Um, another part of this video, she goes to um, three different cities and visits with different family families and just tries to kind of understand what they think about the American dream and their own struggles with trying to achieve it. So first she goes to Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania. She visits a fire station and she finds out that 60% of the firefighters have to work two or three jobs to pay their bills and provide for their families. Whereas in the 1970s, a firefighter could make a living income. He wouldn't have to work or she wouldn't have to work any other job um, in addition to it. Then she also goes to Maryland. Um, she talks to another family where the husband used to have a manufacturing union job, um, but due to outsourcing, the job left. And now he kind of just does um, just individual contract work installing air conditioning. So obviously his wages, his job security has um, kind of gone away. And the wife, she works as a teacher aide at an elementary school and then takes care of her children and then at night takes online classes to pursue a college degree. Um, in part of her interview, she almost breaks down um, saying that her biggest splurge is to go to McDonald's one time a month 
and she expresses a lot of regret at having to spend $18 at McDonald's. Um, so it kind of just shows that people who work very, very hard, work multiple jobs, do all that they can, um, still kind of have to feel guilt at just going to buy a few cheap hamburgers for their family one time a month. Um, so that kind of goes back to that notion of meritocracy and how even though we kind of have this belief in America that if you work hard, you'll make it in this world um, and you can move up in your uh, mobility and um, move up in your social status. Um, it's not always true. Sometimes people who work very, very hard cannot um, kind of rise up out of that position. Um, then Diane Sawyer goes to another family in California. Um, that family, the father is a microbiologist. The mother works four part-time jobs and yet they still live um, in a rented two bedroom apartment with their children. They can't afford a home. Um, she can't afford her daughter's dentist bill. And she expresses a lot of um, kind of insecurity and fear um, and kind of confusion for how, um, how they've ended up like this despite all their hard work. Um, so then uh, Diane Sawyer goes and talks about middle class security, um, this kind of notion of the American dream, being able to put away savings to save for retirement, to go on vacations and out to dinner, and how that's actually less and less a part of um, the true middle class reality right now. And at the end of um, the special, she talks about the rise of what she calls super commuters. And these are people who cannot afford to live near their work. So in particular, she um, visits the home of this man who travels um, and works a job and travels 80 miles from his home every day to go to work and to come back. Um, and in addition, he doesn't have a car, so she they kind of um, follow him during his uh, travels to work that morning. And he wakes up at 3.30 a.m., um, gets on a bike, rides five miles to the bike, um, to the bus station, then takes a bus um, an hour uh, further so he can get to his job. Um, goes and works and comes back home and uh, takes the bus and then bikes back home. And he said he spends um, about six to eight hours biking and taking the bus to and from work every day. So um, he hardly, you know, doesn't really get to see his family when you're traveling to go to work and then you work a shift and then it takes you so long to get back. Um, you're not going to see your family very often. You probably are not getting very much rest. Um, and uh, he also kind of regrets and talks about how he wants to take classes to kind of better himself and get a college degree. But... Um, with the way things are and his current job and this situation, um, he's not able, he doesn't have time to even um, consider taking a class or to pursue a college degree. So I hope y'all will watch this one. It's not too long, it moves pretty quickly. It's about 15 minutes long. So now I just wanted to give you all a little more of a, um, a localized look at income inequality and in particular look at Atlanta, Georgia, um, our northern uh, urban center. So this study was done um, last year and it compared the income inequality for major metro cities across the country. And the conclusion was that Atlanta 
um, down here on this map in that yellow circle Atlanta has the highest income inequality of any major US city as of right now um, the city of LA comes um, right behind Atlanta but Atlanta is the um, has the most income inequality of any city that's more than New York more than Miami more than Chicago um, more than San Francisco etc so what does that mean it means that um, kind of that gap between your poorest citizen and your richest citizen within the city is the largest uh, so we're gonna look particularly at the um, second bullet point and the fourth one here so we'll start with this one up here from 1970 to 2000 income growth in metro Atlanta outpaced national income growth each decade so Atlanta was doing really well for 30 years people's incomes were growing um, and inequality wasn't like it is right now um, the Great Recession however in 2008 however dramatically changed this trajectory while the average metro Atlanta so across the US the average city saw a slight increase of 3% in uh, per capita income between 2000 and 2010 Metro Atlanta experienced a 12% decline um, so things kind of after the recession were a lot worse in Atlanta than other cities in the country so incomes in Atlanta have rebounded a little bit since 2010 yet um, we still have this high income inequality in Atlanta that has stuck around since the recession then we'll go down to this fourth bullet point in 1970 the poorest 20 percent of neighborhoods in the eight county region of Atlanta had roughly 17 percent of all family income in the region so the poorest 20 percent of neighborhoods had about 17 percent of the income that's not too off right but currently and that was in 1970 currently the poorest 20% of neighborhoods have only 6% of all the income so a pretty drastic change since 1970 and this has kind of happened across the entire country since the recession um, some people have been able to kind of rebound from um, the economic losses that were brought about during that and however um, majority of people have not really been able to um, rebound and get back to the same place that they were at before the recession occurred of course when we talk about social stratification in the US um, and income inequality and wealth inequality we definitely cannot address that without also looking at the racial wealth gap in the United States also um, the racial wealth gap refers to kind of systemic um, differences in terms of uh, how much white American families have and are able to make and um, when compared with black families and african-american families in the United States so if you do have Netflix I recommend watching um, episode 1 or episode 20 of season 1 um, on the Netflix series unexplained and it's called the the racial wealth gap and just it's about 15 minute overview um, of what this means and the different kind of aspects to it and also what caused it what kind of um, structural causes uh, make it so that african-american families have so much less than white families even today so if we look at the little bar graph here on the upper right 
you'll see um, a graph that depicts concentrated poverty rates by race, race and ethnicity. And the darker blue graphs are representing the years 2005 to 2009, and the lighter blue is representing 2010 to 2014. So you can see um, concentrated poverty and race. Um, if we look at, let me get my highlighter, look at this first graph. This is just the total poverty rate in the U.S. overall. So um, all races and ethnicities combined and averaged. So in 2005 to 9, the poverty rate was 10.5%. And in 2010 to 2014, the average poverty rate in the country rose to 13.5%, so it went up by three. But when we break this down and look at it by race and ethnicity, um, you'll see that that kind of average across the entire country, it conceals some greater disparities that were felt by um, black and Hispanic families. So if we look at the white graphs here, um, in 2005 to 2009, the white poverty rate was 4.1%. And in 2010 to 2014, it rose a little over 1% to 5.5%. Then if we look at um, black African American families in the US, you can see the bar graph gets um, a lot higher. So from 2005 to 2009, um, African American families were experiencing 21.2% uh, poverty rate. And in 2010 to 2014, that rose to 25.1% poverty. So one in four black Americans um, between 2010 and 2014 were living in poverty. And then if we look at Hispanic Americans, the last set over here in 2005 to 2009, Hispanic Americans were experiencing poverty rates just below 13%. And 2010 to 2014 rose to about 17.6%. So you can see even though, even though the averages over here don't seem horrible, when you break it down by racial category, um, I mean, at the same time that uh, black Americans are experiencing 25% um, poverty rates, white Americans are only experiencing 5%. And then um, down here on the bottom, you can just see a little graphic with a pretty stark statistic. And that is that um, white families' assets, the average white family's assets comes to about $171,000. So everything they own, their stocks, their bonds, their house, their car, anything that qualifies as that family's wealth so for white Americans, that's $171,000. But the average black family in America, their assets on average are only about $17,600. So it's a pretty huge gap um, between your average black family's wealth and your average white family's wealth in America. So the racial wealth gap. In 1963, white Americans' median family wealth was $50,000 more than black Americans' um, median family wealth. This income gap has expanded since 1963. As of 2016, again, median family wealth for white Americans was $171,000, while that uh, medium family wealth for black Americans, again, was 17600 In other words, the median family wealth held by white Americans 
is almost 10 times that of black American families. So much of US family wealth, two thirds of it is derived from home ownership. Systemic issues and racialized policies in the US have made it a lot more difficult for a lot of black American families to become homeowners. And there's some practices um, that go on kind of in the home buying process that um, kind of deters and keeps black American families from owning homes or, own, or at least owning homes in neighborhoods where the property value will be more valuable. So for example, we have the practice of redlining and that is when banks um, or companies will refuse a loan or insurance to someone because they live in an area deemed to be um, of a poor financial risk. And usually those areas are associated with higher percentages of uh, minorities living there. And another example would be the practice of racial steering. This is when real estate agents will guide home buyers away from or towards certain neighborhoods on the basis of race and ethnicity. So a black family might be looking for a home. They might have, maybe um, they have very good family income. Maybe they make 100,000 a year. They can afford to buy a home. Um, but sometimes real estate agents will uh, utilize this practice of racial steering and um, for instance they might not show that uh, african-american family certain houses that are in white quote-unquote white neighborhoods um, and it's kind of a more um, more of an under the radar uh, form of segregation that occurs in society um, so we can look at, again, this graph on the right. This one um, finds that nationally white families are significantly wealthier than all other racial and ethnic groups combined. And this is a study that was done in 2016. So you can see, again, um, the average white family has $171,000 in assets, whereas black family, your average African-American family will have 17,600. Your average Latino or Latinx family will um, have about $20,700 in assets. And then your other category, uh, maybe Asian Pacific Islanders um, will have assets around 64, 65,000. But even all of those combined are less than the average white American family's assets of 171,000. So a bit more on the racial wealth gap here. Um, so 2018 US poverty rates. While the poverty rate for the population as a whole is a little under 12%, the rate varies greatly by race. Again, so Native Americans have the highest poverty rate at 24%. Black Americans have a poverty rate of 22%. That's double kind of the national average. The Hispanic American poverty rate is 19%. And the Asian American poverty rate is 11 but the poverty rate of white Americans is the lowest at 9%, and that's under the average. So while the unemployment rate for white workers peaked at 9.1% in 2010 and is now down to 6.1%, Native Americans have experienced double digit unemployment rates ever since 2008, hovering around 11%. Some Native American tribes report unemployment rates as high as 85%. In the poorest Native American counties, only about one third of men in these communities have full-time year-round employment. And the Native American high school dropout rate is twice the nas national average. 
uh, many Native American schools are kind of systematically underfunded and Native American children consistently earn poorer scores on standardized math and reading tests in comparison with other racial groups. The percentage of homes that are overcrowded, meaning more than one person living per room on reservations is three to six times higher than the percentage of overcrowded homes in the U.S. as a whole. Only about 10% of Native American land across the U.S. has internet access. Even when it is accessible, it's more expensive than it is around the rest of the country. So that racial wealth gap certainly applies to um, Black and African American families, also Hispanic American and some Asian American families, but also um, in particular, Native Americans have uh, experienced um, kind of the worst of this racial wealth gap in the U.S. So now let's consider kind of these different theoretical perspectives and how they interpret social stratification and inequality. So first we'll start with structural functionalism um, and in particular, the Davis-Moore thesis, which states that the greater the functional importance of a social role, the greater must be the reward. Social stratification represents the inherently unequal value of different work. So a structural functionalist will say that certain tasks in society are more valuable than others. Firefighters are more valuable than a cashier. Um, a doctor is more valuable than um, a dishwasher. So a structural functionalist would say that qualified people who fill these very important um, kind of social positions, they deserve a reward to distinguish them from other people. Um, and structural functionalism would say that rewarding more important work with higher levels of income prestige and power encourages other people to work harder and longer. So structural functionalism kind of kind of assumes that meritocracy is perfect in America or in, in any um, society and that hard work pays off and with hard work you'll fill more important social positions and jobs, and thus you'll get paid more money, and a structural functionalist would see nothing wrong with that. So to them, um, social inequality is just a natural um, outcome of certain people doing more quote unquote valuable jobs for society. Um, so social stratification to a structural functionalist is necessary to promote excellence, productivity, and efficiency, and gives people something to strive for. Because if people think um, that they just, if they work hard enough and fill these important positions in society, then they can make it um, and make more money and um, kind of stand out among the rest of society in terms of what they contribute and their value. So Davis and Moore believed that systems of stratification serve society as a whole because it allows everyone to benefit to a certain extent. So again, structural functionalism, um, inequality is just natural. It's going to happen. Some people will be better um, at serving society's demands than others will be. And the people who do um, end up in those greater positions um, deserve kind of this economic reward. Um, they deserve these higher paychecks than the rest of society. Now, conflict theory kind of takes the opposite perspective. Again, conflict theory is all about um, social change coming about because of inequalities in society that erupt in conflict between different groups. So conflict theory is 
always critical of social stratification and inequality. It benefits the few and not everyone in society. A strained working relationship between the employers and the employees or the rich and the poor or the bourgeoisie and the proletariat exists in society and um, that kind of inequality between um, people is not um, not productive for society as a whole to become the best society that we can be. So stratification perpetuates inequality and it exists in order to preserve the rich as rich and the poor as poor. Um, so a conflict theorist, for instance, would think it's wrong that a basketball player is paid millions of dollars, but a public school teacher earns $35,000 a year and even um, less than that for many firefighters. So conflict theory um, would kind of step in and say to a uh, structural functionalist, well, f so many firefighters today don't make a living wage and that's a very important social um, kind of contribution that their job um, makes for society and yet they have to work two to three jobs and this is wrong especially when you see you know a celebrity basketball player who's making millions of dollars a year um, so again stratification creates further class conflict And then we have the symbolic interactionist um, kind of interpretation of social stratification. And again, symbolic interactionism um, isn't about all these big overarching theories about society. Symbolic interactionists are more interested in getting down on the ground, um, studying people kind of in a more intimate setting and understanding um, the way that people view their own lives and not just assigning um, or saying your life is horrible because you're poor. Um, it's more about the um, people's own perspective on their situation. So symbolic interactionism strives to explain how people's social standing affects their everyday interactions. In most communities, people primarily interact with other people of the same social rank who share the same income level, educational background, racial background, um, and tastes in music, food, and clothing. And this kind of built-in system of social stratification naturally groups people together. People's appearance reflects their perceived social standing. So depending on you know what class you perceive yourself being a part of, um, you might live in a certain kind of house, decorate your house in a certain way, wear certain clothing, um, drive specific kind of car, or um, maybe you use a bicycle as transportation or a skateboard, or, um, or do you use a, a private yacht or a private plane? Um, People in different social standings um, have different hairstyles, wear different accessories, and kind of um, display different personal styles. And all these different kind of aspects of what we wear and how we live on a day-to-day -day basis indicate our social status to other people in society. So one um, kind of idea that comes out of symbolic interactionist um, view on social stratification is this idea of conspicuous consumption. Um, and this means um, when people purchase and use certain products like a Tesla or the latest iPhone, primarily in order to make a social statement about one's status. So that we buy, it's the idea that we buy and kind of display certain things or items or technologies um, 
primarily in order to kind of show it off, in order to um, tell the world in a way uh, about our social standing, that I can afford an iPhone or a Tesla kind of says something about me and by me just owning it and showing it off and driving down the road or taking my iPhone out at Starbucks for all to see, um, kind of just um, displaying these items uh, makes a statement about your status to other people without having to show them your paycheck, for instance. And the term conspicuous consumption was coined back in 1899 by the sociologist and economist Thorstein Veblen. And he defined conspicuous consumption as a common social behavior through which individuals emulate the consumption patterns of other individuals situated at higher points in the class status hierarchy. People spend money on artifacts of consumption in order to give an indication of their wealth to other members of society. So this search for status, however, through consumption is never ending. What at one time may confer status may later be acquired by all or confer no status. So for example, um, owning a beeper in the 1980s was a high status symbol. It meant that you were like a lawyer or a doctor, somebody who had to be reached immediately when needed. However, of course, owning a beeper today instead of a cell phone um, would surely bring ridicule. Nobody owns beepers anymore. So um, whereas in the 80s, owning a beeper was a high status symbol, today it would be um, kind of more of a joke. So people must always try to acquire new consumption goods in order to distinguish themselves from others. Kind of have to keep up with the times and continue buying, you know, the latest gadget, the latest iPhone, um, the newest Tesla, etc. To kind of continually display that um, you're able to afford these things to other people. And um, I have a couple uh, quotes here from Veblen on the right side of the screen. So we'll start with this one on a little square. The basis on which good repute, so a good reputation in any highly organized industrial community ultimately rests is pecuni pecuniary strength. And that means how much money you have, monetary strength and the means of showing pecuniary strength and so of gaining or retaining a good name are leisure and a conspicuous consumption of goods. And then down here, it frequently happens that an element of the standard of living, which set out with being primarily wasteful, ends with becoming, in the apprehension of the consumer, a necessary of life. And it may in this way become as indispensable as any other item of the consumer's habitual expenditure. So he's basically saying that um, in particular, uh, modern Western societies are all about kind of showing off your wealth, kind of this ostentatious um, display to almost in a way prove to other people that you are worthy, that you are valuable through the things that you own and wear, through the cars that you own and drive, um, the kind of pets you have, the kind of hats you wear, the watch you own, um, and so on. So it's kind of this, um, this way that we enact our social status and perform it kind of constantly on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you can also think about um, kind of like Chinatown in New York that sell, sells a lot of counterfeit designer bags. Um, that's kind of what the whole counterfeit industry is about, is conspicuous consumption. Um, 
whereas maybe a middle class or lower ca class person can't afford like the newest um, Dooney and Burke bag or um, the newest Manolo Blonix, um, you can go and buy kind of counterfeit um, products that look like the real thing but aren't. And why do people wear it? wear these things or um, display these items it's to kind of um, prove to other people that maybe you're of a higher status than they might have thought otherwise that you're able to afford that Dooney and Burke bag even though um, you know that it's a false representation it's not the real thing quote unquote um, but as long as other people perceive it as the real thing is what matters. And 80 years after um, Veblen coined the term conspicuous consumption, um, another sociologist in 1979 named Pierre Bourdieu published his book Distinction, a Social Critique of the Judgment of Taste. And Bourdieu claims that how one chooses to present one's social space to the world. So your aesthetic dispositions, what we buy, wear, and display, depicts one's status and distances oneself from lower groups. The, quote, symbolic goods that we consume and display are the, quote, ideal weapons in strategies of distinction. He claimed that the lower classes were mostly indicative of tastes of necessity, whereas the upper class exemplified tastes of luxury. Bourdieu claims and believes that class distinction and preferences are most marked in the ordinary choices of everyday existence, like our furniture, our clothing, and our cooking. And I have a couple quotes from Bourdieu here. First one up top says, consumption is, in this case, a stage in a process of communication. That is, an act of deciphering, decoding, which presupposes practical or explicit mastery of a cipher or a code. In a sense, one can say that the capacity to see is a function of the knowledge or concepts. That is, the words that are available to name visible things and which are, as it were, programs for perception. A work of art has meaning and interest only for someone who possesses the cultural competence, that is, the code into which it is encoded. A beholder who lacks the specific code feels lost in a chaos of sounds and rhythms, colors and lines without rhyme or reason. The I is a product of history reproduced by education. And then this second quote, social subjects classified by their classifications distinguish themselves by the distinctions they make between the beautiful and the ugly, the distinguished and the vulgar, in which their position in the objective classifications is expressed or betrayed. Art and cultural consumption are predisposed, consciously and deliberately or not, to fulfill a social function of legitimating social differences. So what Bourdieu's saying here is that because we're born to specific classes, upper class, middle class, lower class, our families and the people who raise us and the education that we receive due to our class kind of status, um, it constructs us in such a way that we um, end up having different tastes in music and different tastes in um, leisure, um, different tastes in terms of what we want to wear, um, what brands we like, what movies we watch. Um, so for instance, in his book, he talks about kind of these wealthy children that he observes and they're like five, six years old and there's 
some symphony playing and the wealthy children can name the exact symphony um, that's being played on, on the radio. Whereas a lower or middle class child, just for the fact that they're not really being raised around other people who listen to, you know, symphony um, music, they won't recognize that song. So he's saying that our different class positions affect us um, not only economically and what we can afford and how we can live um, according to our standard of living, but it also affects just our very perception of culture and uh, music and art and film. Our class position kind of affects everything. Um, what radio station we listen to and um, the way we present ourselves, our styles of clothing, um, whether, you know, we prefer foie gras and, um, you know, steak for dinner, or if we prefer to just go grab some chicken McNuggets at McDonald's. These are all kind of ways that we enact our class position um, and kind of perform it by way of our tastes. And um, you will see Veblen and Bordeaux um, show up again when we get to the Unit 2 discussion. Um, I have some excerpts from them posted under Chapter 9, a little bit longer, um, that might give you a little better idea of um, kind of their overarching uh, messages. And one of your three discussion options for Unit 2 will cover um, those readings. So if you kind of find this aspect of um, kind of the symbolic interactionist interpretation of social stratification interesting, um, keep them in mind and you can do your Unit 2 discussion based on this idea of conspicuous consumption and um, taste. This brings us to the end of this week's lecture for Chapter 9 on Social Stratification in the United States and it also finishes up Unit 2 for us. Um, so now that this unit is over, you will um, work on your Unit 2 discussion um, post and prepare for the Unit 2 exam. Make sure to study over the Unit 2 exam review posted on Blackboard. Um, I guarantee if you study that review and are knowledgeable about the contents in there, you will do well on the um, Unit 2 exam. And next week we'll come back and start Unit 3 with Chapter 10 and look at uh, social stratification on a global scale. All right, hope y'all have a great week. Keep in touch. If you have any questions, post them on Blackboard or send me an email at kadams at columbustech.edu.